Hey, Mr. Traeger here. Um, today we're going to be talking about a topic that's pretty sensitive. Um, some of you may not even really want to talk about this. Um, you know, I know a lot of people come from different backgrounds. The topic we're going to talk about today has to do with depression and suicide. <clears throat> and I think it's important that you listen to this. It's important that you you pay attention to what, what I'm talking about today, even though it may not be comfortable, even though it may not be something that you really want to talk about, because it's a big problem. And if we don't learn more about this and we don't talk about some of the issues related to depression and suicide, the problem isn't going to get any better. Uh, right now, statistics run between anywhere from the second to third leading cause of death for uh, teenagers in the United States is suicide. Um, that's more than homicide. Uh, that's more than illnesses. That's more than um, uh, accidental deaths. Um, all those things. The only thing that really beats uh, suicide right now is alcohol-related crashes or, or drug-related crashes. Um, and so this is, it's turned into a big problem, and it's something we need to address. So what I'm going to encourage you to do, as, as difficult as this is to listen to, is to pay attention, listen to it, um, have, have an open heart to this, because you may grab something that not only can maybe benefit you in the future, but possibly somebody else. All right. So what we're going to talk about today isn't so much... Um, uh, you know, a, a solution to ending suicide, but we're going to understand a little bit more about what influences uh, depression in the United States. And if we can understand those influencers, we can better understand how we can deal with those influencers. All right. Now, as always, I usually start with a question. So my question for you today is, what if I were to tell you that the United States doesn't have a suicide problem? What if I were to ask you that question? The United States doesn't have a suicide problem. What would you think? Most of us would say, you're crazy. Of course we have a suicide problem. You just told us that it's anywhere between the second to third leading cause of death for, for American teenagers. All right? And that's true. But the problem isn't really suicide. See, suicide is the symptom of a problem. The real problem in the United States is depression. And so in the, in the center of this web that we're going to talk about is depression, and that's the real issue. And so everything that we're going to be talking about is going to point to what's influencing depression in teenagers. And then in, as a result, that depression then leads to suicide. There's not a whole lot of people that are killing themselves because they're too happy. Um, depression almost always, 100% of the time, precedes a, a suicidal episode, a suicidal mindset, a suicide attempt. Um, that's what suicide has in common is depression, and that's what we're going to spend our time kind of talking about. If we take suicide away, we don't get rid of the depression problem. But if we get rid of depression, we almost literally get rid of the suicide problem. And so that's what the focus needs to be. Um, the suicide is, is the symptom. Take example, you have a sliver in your thumb. All right. If I only deal with the surface of what's on my thumb, I deal with a little, maybe, maybe it's bleeding. All right. And I ignore that for a while, and pretty soon it heals over. Um, and that sliver is still inside my thumb. All right. The problem is the sliver. That's the issue. And even though it looks all fine and dandy on the surface, if I push on it, and I put pressure on it, it's still, I still feel the sliver. And then we deal with infection. We deal with all kinds of stuff underneath the skin. If we want to solve this problem, what do we have to do? We have to get to the sliver. We have to deal with the issue. We have to get some tweezers. We have to get a needle. We have to dig down in there. And sometimes that hurts. It's painful. And we need to pull that sliver out. When we pull that sliver out, we push on it. It heals up. We push on it. The pain's gone. We've learned how to deal with it. We've, we've dealt with the problem, not just the symptom of putting a Band-Aid over that sliver and hoping it will go away. And that's what we're going to be talking about a little bit is how do we deal with this depression? How do we understand what's causing it so that we can understand how to fix it? All right? And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about. So what we have here are basically six big influencers uh, for depression in teenagers today. And that's what we're going to spend our time. I know there's other things, and we hear stories of other things happening, and a lot of times those fit into these categories. So we've tried to isolate these, these main uh, large categories for us to talk about. All right, so let's talk about the first one. The first one is pressure. It's probably the one that most people identify with and understand, uh, or would come up with an example of. Now, pressure is divided into two different categories. We have school pressure, and what school pressure is is literally the pressure to succeed in school, getting all A's, getting into that Ivy League school uh, or college, getting into any college, uh, making sure we get a certain score on ACT. Uh, making sure we're, we're passing all of our honors courses, that kind of pressure. It's literally how am I doing in school. And then the second part of pressure is the social pressure, and this is the peer pressure. This is the trying to fit in, being accepted, the having the boyfriend, having the girlfriend, getting the prom date, um, being popular, um, having a group of friends, knowing that, that you know I, I belong in, in a friendship group. That's the social pressure and the things that's, that kids will do in order to 
um, achieve that social status or achieve that those social relationships sometimes leads us down that road uh, to developing depression. Now, none of these things cause depression to happen. And that's important to understand. We're talking about influencers. These are all things that influence depression to occur. All right. So the first big one, big influencer, is what we call pr uh, pressure. All right. School pressure and or social pressure. The second one is the increase in divorce. Now, it's no mystery that over half of us come from a divorced family. I think the statistic right now is anywhere between 62 and 64 percent of marriages that occur today end in divorce. All right. So um, out there in you know video land, YouTube land, um, over half of us come from a divorced family. All right. And, and that's not a big surprise to anybody. All right. The question is, why does divorce have such a big impact on teenagers in terms of influencing depression? And the answer is, is almost 100% of the time, the kids somehow put pressure or blame on themselves for the failure of their parents' marriage. And usually that is the furthest from the truth. Um, kids always bring a degree of stress or a degree of, of um, uh, what I want to say, um, difficulties or, or um, strains on a marriage just because it's the nature of, of life. It's always been that way. I mean, you've got more people, you've got developing kids, you've got you know, meltdowns, you've got kids that are making goofy decisions. It's always going to bring that into a family, but, t but very rarely does that create the relationship problems. The number one cause of, of marital problems is financial. It has to do with spending more money than you bring in. Um, and that's usually the number one one beginning that tears the relationship apart, even more so than things like affairs or or that kind of stuff. It usually starts off with money. Uh, that's usually the biggest issue. But kids, a lot of times with divorced families, feel like they contributed to the problem, and if they would have done something different, mom and dad would still be together. And that puts a lot of pressure again on on kids, therefore influencing depression. Uh, not to mention all the changes that go on with families, and you deal with step parents, you deal with step brothers, half brothers, half sisters, um, you know, all those kinds of things. The the whole the whole relationship between mom and dad not liking each other in some cases, and moving from one place to another every other weekend. All those things add to that mix of of not being uh, at peace or not being comfortable with what's going on in my life. All right. Uh, the third one, the media. I, I mean, I could spend. I guess I could do a whole video just just on the media itself, uh, and and we will talk about media in, in a lot of different areas in terms of sexuality and all these kinds of things. What the media feeds to us, how does the media influence depression in teenagers? Well, it it if it influences uh, men and women, boys and girls differently. All right, the media hits women primarily, and this is probably no shock to you ladies out there. Is primarily the media hits women uh, in the in the areas of appearance, body image. Uh, that's usually the number one thing. Um, models are seen as thin. They're seen as uh, usually blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, they usually have, you know, big chest. They usually have the the round booty. They've got the tall legs. They've, you know, all those things. You know, smooth skin, perfect, no no blemishes. All those kinds of things. All right. And for teenage girls, especially, to try to measure up to adult women can be very difficult. And a lot of times, the models that are being portrayed to teenage girls are typically not teenagers themselves. They're in their early 20s. So they're fully grown women that are modeling towards younger girls. Um, and that puts a whole lot of pressure on in terms of what the appearance should look like and, and um, how that influences their self-esteem and their self-image. And it starts hitting girls at a very young age. Uh, middle school, even younger girls start, being, they start worrying about their weight. They start worrying about their, um, you know, how their clothes fit them. They're starting to worry about um, how they look, their hair color, all these kinds of things hit girls at very young ages. Boys, on the other hand, typically get hit more in the pocketbook, and that's where the media influences depression for boys. Um, it has more to do with the kind of car you drive, the house that you have, um, the number of houses you have, how many extra toys do you have, the four-wheelers, the, the boats, the wave runners, the cabin up north, um, all those kinds of things, the kind of watch that you have, um, the types of shoes that you have. Um, all those things factor into the image of men being rich. How many of you ladies out there have been told or have had the attitude of marry a doctor or a lawyer? Why? Because they have money. And, and guys, we internalize this and we view money as success. And when we don't have the money, it hits us in, in a sense of our pride that people who have more money than, than we do are somehow better. Um, which is really not the case, but that, that's an internal psyche thing that we deal with. Now, here's the difference. Men usually get hit with this money idea a lot later in life than women get hit with the body image issue. 
Um, typically men start dealing with the money issue after they graduate from college or after they're out of high school and they're starting to work and they're starting to branch out on their own. Um, typically they're going to be in their 20s, 25, 30 years old. That's when it's going to start to hit them. Now typically their brain should be developed enough where they understand you know, um, how to deal with some of these pressures and to realize, you know what, that's not where happiness is. The problem is that girls are getting hit at 13, 14 years old. And they don't have sometimes the, the skills that they need to be able to translate some of those messages. And so that's a huge deal in terms of how men and women deal with depression. And that's also why women are three times more likely to attempt suicide. Unfortunately, men are 50% more likely to follow through or complete a suicide, typically because of the methods that they use. Uh, but women typically are more likely to attempt to make a suicide attempt than boys. And, and I think media plays a big part in that. Um, so that's another big influencer is media. The next one is what we call nomadic families. And nomadic families are families that move around a lot. The, the best example I could give of a nomadic family would be a military family. you got mom or dad in the military. They're being stationed every two years in a completely different place in, in the country or maybe even outside the country. And so every couple of years, you're, you're breaking off those relationships. You're moving into a new community. You're starting a new school. You're the new kid all over again. And everything starts again knowing that in two years you're going to be doing it all over. Now, the issue with kids isn't so much the starting over and being um, uh, the new kid in a school. It has to do with the breaking off of the relationships um, from the school that they were in. All right, And because that becomes difficult, the logical thing is when I go to the new school, if I don't get really connected to anybody um, at the new school or at the new, in the new place, then when I leave that place, it's not as difficult. And so what happens is I start to isolate myself because the leaving part is just too hard to deal with. And so uh, that's where some of the depression issues come in is because of the loneliness because I don't feel like I really connect with anybody because I'm not going to allow myself because it's too hard to leave those relationships. And that's where the nomadic family comes in. Nomadic families can be very solid, very supportive, very loving, very, very good family. So it's not, it's not the fact that families move around that creates the problem. It's how I deal with the constant moving as a teenager um, and dealing with that stress of, always having to leave and, and make new friends and it's just easier for me not to make those those close friendships all right so that's nomadic families the next one is what we call QFT quality family time now we're starting to see some of this change a little bit but what that means is is how much time do we how much quality time do we spend at home it doesn't have to do with quantity how how, how much I'm at home it's what am I doing how am I connecting with those family relationships we talked about things like family game nights we talk about eating dinner together having a a Sunday meal or having a, a family night where everybody's supposed to stay home on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night or whatever night might happen. And those are all, all ways to um, bring some of that quality time back into the family. Um, we talked about developing assets uh, earlier in the year. And assets, you know, when you look at how many times it has to do with connecting with your family and family support and and your, your home, you know, more than then four nights a week, um, you know, those kinds of things. And that's all part of this quality family time that you fit in, that you belong uh, in a place. You feel like you belong, you're accepted uh, within that family unit. And that's where the quality family time comes up. So one thing to think about for you is how often do you make it a priority to be home with family? Um, it's not just up to your parents to make that up and to, to say you've got to stay home. How often do you choose to stay home? Um, you got to think about that. Do you introduce things that the family can do? Um, do you do you know, dinner together? Do you have a family game night? Do you have family traditions that you take part in um, and, and that you make it a priority? And that's what quality family time is. And this isn't your parents' job solely. It's also part of your responsibility. All right. And when we don't feel like we fit in and we don't feel like that our parents care about us, maybe we should take a look at how much are we putting into those relationships too. All right. And that's another influencer for depression is that quality family time. Um, and then the last big influencer is abuse. Abuse is probably the one that gets the most attention, I'd say, between pressure and abuse. gets the most attention in terms of depression and suicide. And abuse comes in a lot of different forms. Um, and I'll briefly uh, list and go through these. Physical abuse, we're all familiar with that, where you're using some kind of physical violence against somebody. This is someone getting hit or uh, physically abused by somebody, punched, kicked, that kind of stuff. Um, there's uh, verbal abuse. This is where I'm using words. This is going to be the name calling. This is going to be the... Um, demeaning comments, stuff like that, using my words to hurt somebody. Then there's sexual abuse, and this is where I'm using any kind of sexual um, touching, any kind of sexual behavior to control a person, to, um, to injure a person, to hurt a person, 
um, especially for my personal gain. That would be sexual abuse. Um, emotional abuse. Now, emotional and verbal abuse a lot of times go hand in hand. And what emotional abuse is, is when I use emotions as a way to control or to, to hurt somebody. Um, withholding emotions. If my daughter um, uh, gets a B in a class and so uh, I ignore her until her grade comes up, that would be an example of emotional abuse. I'm not physically abusing her. I'm not calling her names. But I'm withholding love. I'm withholding emotional uh, an emotional connection from her until she does what I wanted to do. That's emotional abuse, withholding love, um, that kind of stuff. That's, that's what emotional abuse is. Then there's chemical abuse, and this is drugs and alcohol. Um, so either the use of drugs or alcohol personally or the use of drugs and alcohol in the family uh, can influence depression. Um, and then lastly is this neglect, and neglect is where we're not providing, we're not getting uh, the basic needs uh, that, that um, we need, food, water, shelter. Um, those things aren't being provided, and that can influence uh, depression as well. So now we've got our six big players, all right? We've got pressure, divorce, the media, nomadic families, quality family time, and abuse. Now, here's the issue, is that these are all influencers, all right? They don't cause abuse because you could say, well, I come from a divorced family and I'm not depressed or my family moves around a lot. I'm not depressed. Um, you know, I barely see my parents because they work, you know, they're always working and I'm not depressed and that's absolutely 100% true. All this means is, is that the more of these things you have in your life, the higher the chance is that you could be dealing with some depression. And if you deal with some depression, there's also the chance that that could lead to potentially a suicidal situation. That's all that means. You can have people that have all these things going on in their life. They're dealing with abuse. They don't have a family to speak of. They're, they move around all the time. The media they can't really control. Their parents you know, are divorced, and there's a lot of pressure that they have. And they're not dealing with depression at all. They're able to handle all these pressures. And you have other people who really aren't dealing with hardly any of these things, maybe the pressure in media because we can't really get away from that, and they're still dealing with depression. So there's, there's no rhyme or reason saying if you have these, you will. It just means that the more you have, the higher the tendency is for you to struggle with depression. And so that's important to know because if I have these things going on in my life, I have to be more conscious of how I'm going to handle these issues so that I can be better prepared to protect myself, to be resilient from depression. Now, the question is, how do I do that? What if I got these things going on and maybe I'm starting to feel the strain a little bit and I'm struggling with this depression thing? What do I do? All right. Well, we've already talked about that. All those skills we talked about, especially when we talked about anger, when we talked about um, how to deal with the emotional management stuff, how do we deal with strong emotions? Depression's one of them. And so the big thing that we can do is first recognize those automatic negative thoughts. And that's kind of what we're doing here is we're recognizing these negative things that are happening to us. We, a lot of these things we don't have control over. They're going to happen. The second thing is, skill number two, is diffusers. And diffusers are huge. And I think that's the biggest issue that we can deal with with, with the suicide problem is using diffusers, is changing the way that we think. All right? Media, for example. We see those media messages think, you know what? I'm not buying into that. I'm fine the way that I am. I like who I am. There's, there's more beneficial things to me than how I look, or there's more to me than just how much I make, or nomadic families looking at, this is an opportunity for me to travel to all these different places, meet lots of different people. It's really a great opportunity, even though, yeah, it is hard, but man, there's some great opportunities out there. Quality family time, making it a point to, to interject in your family and be a part of that, and, 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 and you know, learning responsibility, that kind of stuff. Divorce. You know what? My parents are going through a tough time. Um, things didn't work out for them, but that doesn't mean it's my fault. It doesn't mean that I can't love both my parents and I can't have a great relationship with both of them. That's up to me. So how I think is going to change a lot of what's going on with the pressure around me. So diffusers, I can't, I can't explain enough how big of a deal diffusers are um, in helping us battle the depression problem. And I think that's the, the key component to this whole depression thing. And I guess the thing I'm so passionate about, the thing that irritates me so much is when people just flat out give in to that mental stress. And I know it's tough. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to belittle anybody. But there's so many times where you make the choice to think the way that you do and you just choose to give up. And, and that's what's frustrating to me is you just choose not to look at the positive. Um, and that's something that I would challenge you to do. If you're starting to struggle with this depression, change the way you think. You have control over that. You can choose how to think. Um, you can look at the glasses being half empty or half full. It's up to you, and that's what diffusers are, is they're changing the thought process. They're changing the way that you're looking at the problem rather than looking at it as, as you know, um, you know, why is this happening to me? Um, you're looking at it from a, a positive lens of saying, look at this opportunity that I have to learn through this, to learn and grow, and, and <clears throat> try to look for the positive. Look for that silver lining. You have the ability to do that. 
And so that's the biggest way that I think that we can deal with the depression issue. And again, if we deal with the depression issue, the suicide issue takes care of itself. And so that's where I'm going to spend most of my time when we're talking about this stuff is how do we deal with depression, not so much how do we fix suicide because we fix suicide by getting rid of depression. All right? That's all I got. Uh, some serious stuff there. Think about it. Um, look inside yourself in terms of how you use diffusers, how, you, how your thought process works as it relates to all these kinds of things, and start using it to be positive. You can choose to do that. You don't have to give in to those negative thoughts. You don't have to give in to those impulses that want you to do negative things. You have the power to be able to think positively in any given situation because you have 100% control over you. You have 0% control over pretty much all these other things that happen externally. But you can control what you do within them. All right? All right. Choose to be happy. It's a skill that you learn. It doesn't always happen on its own. All right? That's all I got for you today.